coming here today, coming to you today to uh, to bring some uh, some new ideas to you all. Um, and this is something that we're super excited uh, to have an opportunity to to share with you um, coming from the Partnership for Southern Equity. So I'll give you just a, a real quick um, overview if this is your first time to one of our webinars. So you have a, a sense of who we are and what we do. And then I'm going to hand it over to these uh, amazing women who are going to share some um, some great ideas with you around how to really engage uh, young people as leaders in your Just Communities efforts. So next slide, please. And I forget if, if, if I said, I'm Suzanne Burns. Nice to be with you. I'm here with the Just Growth team at Partnership for Southern Equity. So the mission of, part, of PSE is advancing policies and institutional actions that promote racial equity and shared prosperity for all in the growth of Metro Atlanta and the American South. And increasingly, uh, we are coming to you in all parts of the country and beyond the US um, as our partnerships and our work um, expand and we bring our, uh, our Southern sensibilities to the rest of the world. So glad that you're with us if you were outside of the, the American South. Next slide, please. Our work is really about disrupting systems of structural oppression um, and silos that keep us all separate and um, less able to, to see the intersectionality of our work. Uh, we do this work um, within teams that have subject matter expertise and a lot of uh, experience related to energy and just transition issues, um, land use and growth issues, uh, health uh, inequities and uh, opportunity for uh, just inclusion and employment. Um, we have an organizing unit. We have a team that focuses on uh, uh, bringing uh, solutions to different partners through uh, 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 social enterprise uh, consulting practice. And we have our uh, amazing youth power building arm, Yes for Equity, who are going to be with us here today. Um, so that gives you a little bit of sense of uh, the different uh, capacities at PSE and the different structures. And uh, the Just Communities Initiative is um, is really the grounding that we have for these conversations um, that we're bringing to you in our monthly webinar series. So Just Communities, uh, many of you hopefully are familiar with. This is our evolution of the, the work that began as eco districts. And it is grounded in principles um, that really help us to, to weave ideas around racial equity and climate resilience um, into lots of different dimensions of work that happens at a community scale and on development projects. So these principles are around um, really understanding history of, of recognizing the lasting impact of structural racism in our built environment and land use practices in the way that our communities have developed um, we're committed to healing and liberation um, in communities, honoring the wisdom of neighbors and the power of community, asserting racial equity as a superior growth model, committing to strategies that are going to facilitate a just climate transition, and leveraging public policy for reform, repair, and reconciliation. Next slide, please. Hopefully many of you are familiar with the Just Communities Protocol that launched at the beginning of this year. Um, if you are not familiar with it, we encourage you to go on our website, download it, um, put it under your pillow, spend some time with it um, and see what may be there that can help you advance your work on different projects um, and in communities. And uh, it is at the website is justcommunities.info. Um, you can get to it from the main PSC uh, website as well, psequity.org, um, or you can go directly to justcommunities.info. Next slide, please. All right, I'm going to um, go ahead and hand this over to the amazing um, team at uh, Yes for Equity. They're going to provide their own introductions. Um, but I just want to to give a lot of gratitude to to these ladies for what they are being able to uh, to bring to us today. Um, Jasmine Benyus, Denise Webb, and um, and Jessica Daniels, who are going to be sharing with you. And I will step back and let them take the reins now.
Yeah, hi everyone. I just want to say thank you so much for coming and joining us on our sort of um, our webinar. Um, and so today we'll really be talking about um, youth in action and what it looks like to build leaders for um, a just community. All right, so just quickly, uh, my name is Jasmine Bennis. I am an associate um, with Yes for Equity, the youth power building arm at the Partnership for Southern Equity. Um, and I have been with the organization for the past four years, but I've been doing this youth power building work since I was 16 and I am now 22. So um, I have been doing it for a while now and I'm excited to kind of share um, what I've learned along the process. And I'll go ahead and pass it to Denise. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm Denise Webb. I am a senior youth staff here at Partnership for Some Equity. I've been working here for about three and a half years, but they trained me when I was like ninth or tenth grade, and um, I've been stuck with them ever since, or they've been stuck with me ever since. Um, and yeah, I'm a junior at Berry College. Yes, thanks, Denise. And hello, my name is Jessica Daniels, and I have the pleasure of serving as the director of Yes for Equity at the Partnership for Southern Equity. And I'm delighted to bring you greetings from our entire Yes for Equity team that consists of 13 new staff, including Jasmine and, um, and Denise, and who serve as regional organizers in the metro Atlanta area, in the Southeast, and oh, across the nation. Um, and we also have three other adult allies as well, um, who serve as guides on the side to support their youth-led movements. So I also would like to extend greetings from our founder and our chief equity officer, Nathaniel Smith, who is a living example of what the power of youth can do. Um, he is an influential champion for racial justice, and he also was once a youth organizer. So who are we? Yes for Equity was a former nonprofit organization called Youth Empowered Solutions that was acquired by the Partnership for Southern Equity in the summer of 2020. So if there was ever a need for a organization that was committed to racial equity and youth power building, um, the summer of 2020 was a great time to actually be acquired by the Partnership for Southern Equity. Yes for Equity serves as the youth power building arm of PSC and we work in collaboration with PSC's four equity portfolios, including Just Energy, Just Growth, and Just Opportunity, and Just Health. We also work in conjunction with our PSC's organizing unit. So we are a national training and movement building force built on the belief that racial equity and intergenerational power sharing are essential to creating equitable community change. The entity of Yes for Equity has been in existence for over 15 years. We often are asked about our why. Why is it so important to grow youth power in the American South, nationally and globally? Um, we recognize a system systemic, in this country, a systemic problem that needs to be addressed. In the 2020 census revealed for the very first time in our nation's history that the majority of Americans under the age of 18 are people of color. Youth, young people under the age of 18 make up almost 30% of the US population. And this shift in demographics requires a much more intentional effort to center the lives of black and historically disinvested youth of color into all of the work that we do. We believe that structural racism is the underlying root cause of inequities that seek to address that we seek to address across many different sectors, including health, education, economic mobility, housing, safety, and the criminal justice system. Our position is that racial equity is critical to advancing su successful youth power building because of the many ways that youth of color are disproportionately impacted by systems and policies rooted in white oppression. This generation's ability to contribute to a better society is systemically ignored. And our nation has and always will be suffering economically, socially, and civilly as a result. At Yes for Equity, we support the power of youth to change injustice, advocate for racially equitable community transformation, 
And we believe that this is one of the only ways, one, this is the only way to truly um, achieve just communities. So now that you've learned a little bit about who we are, um, I wanna to talk to you a little bit about what you'd be learning over the next 40 minutes as you spend your precious time with us. We're so happy you're here. So today you will get a shared understanding of building youth power in just communities. You will also discover yes, the YES Youth Power Model, which is a nationally recognized model and how to apply it in your community. You also will explore the barriers to building youth power because it's a very intentional process and how to address it. And you also will learn about the additional training and resources that are available through PSC to help you grow into generational partnerships. So as I shared before, youth power building is a very intentional process. Um, first, we will need to do a little bit of housekeeping before we get started. So for some of you, some of the things that you will hear today will be in learning about youth power building may cause you to challenge some of your beliefs if you're learning this for the very first time. However, we respectfully ask that you leave a few of your belief systems at the door. You can pick them up when you leave for sure. Um, we honor everyone in communities who serve the important role of parent or guardian. Because this webinar is focused on youth, parents, we want you to know that you are doing super well with your children. However, we do not want you to equate youth power building with parenting in any way, with your parenting style in any way. Building youth power is completely a different ball game. I know that is a delicate balance to strike as I too am a parent that has a daughter who's 18 years old, who's a growing activist. And I need to know when to take my parent hat off so she can exercise her power. Youth like adults have many roles to play. They can be your sons, they can be your daughters, they can be family members, they can be your friends, they can be students, they can be employees. They have many, many roles just like adults. So our role as allies is to partner with youth to co-create equitable communities for everyone to prosper in, including young people. So during this session, I don't want you to get distracted. You may hear some things that you say, man, my children, we don't do it like that. That's okay. Um, we just want you to not lose sight of our ultimate goal, which is to grow youth power and intergenerational partnerships for just communities, right? Okay. So now I wanna share with you how we define youth, okay? Because a lot of times when people hear youth, they think of a lot of different things. So here are some of the ways youth have taught us at PSC on how they, who they are and who they are not, okay? So first we define youth as all people between the ages of 14 to 24. And if any of you all are here at the policy link um, convening, you know that the word all is really something that we're leaning into. So all means all, right? The important word here is all, the population of youth in our communities is just as diverse as the adult populations in the communities that you work in. So these change, these, um, the, the diversity includes gender, race, ability, sexual orientation, socioeconomic backgrounds, faith, political parties, and any other way that you define difference. But it is important as you build a just community that you content, you include as many as their, of their voices as possible to sit around the tables that adults have the privilege to occupy and help let them help you shape the influence and influence decisions that are made on their behalf. Um, so youth are also a valuable resource of knowledge. In many cases, they are the closest to the problems that we seek to address. Simply put, they know things that we don't, and they have ideas and solutions and issues that are missing from our adult conversations. Youth are also accelerators for equitable social change. 
we have a precedent for this. Many of the social change movements that we have all benefited from have been advanced by brave youth who have taken action because they were sick and tired of being sick and tired. And finally, many times we hear things, uh, sayings like this, and you may have even been um, guilty of saying something like this before, youth are our future or youth are future leaders. Um, we wholeheartedly disagree with those statements. Um, we believe that youth are leaders right now and they have lived experiences, wisdom, energy, power right now. <laughs> um, and honestly, the stakes for their lives are way too high for us to think of them any other way. So who they are not is a problem to solve, right? Many times we are addressing social justice issues and youth get blamed for the challenges that impact their lives. We believe that many times youth are not the ones with the problems, we are as adults. And in order to support youth power, we need to check our biases, our stereotypes, our preconceived notions about who we think youth are. So another way, youth don't need us also to do something for them. You'll hear this over and over again if you hang out with us at Yes for Equity a lot. They are not helpless beings. In order for us to grow youth power in our communities, we have to abandon the notion of doing something for youth, right? Instead of doing something for them, we should really consider what it would look like to reimagine systems where we're doing things with them. And finally, youth are not a group that needs to be empowered. I remember the first week that we were here at PSC, uh, Nathaniel, Nathaniel made it extremely clear to us that we do not empower youth. Um, so we had to change our name. We had to take empower out of every single document that we had um, coming from Youth Empowered Solutions. So um, this is something that is not, we don't empower youth and we don't empower anybody else for that matter. Youth and people in general have their own power. We help, our role as allies is to help support and also act as guides on the side um, as they learn to walk in their power. So what does racial equity have to do with growing youth power in a just community, right? We always talk about um, racial equity. PSC is an organization that advances racial equity and in institutional practices and policies for shared prosperity for all in the American South and now the global South. And we are often asked, why do you always focus in on black people? So the simple answer is the data supports it. As a part of the, the PSC way, of our PSC way to transform systems of oppression, we know that data is a powerful tool. And we often say people are entitled, people are often in, are off, people are entitled to their own opinions, but they can't make up their own facts. They're not entitled to their own facts. So we know that when data is disaggregated by race, black people often live in what we call the bookends. Okay. So they can show up in the highest and adverse adverse social justice indicators, including dropout rates, unemployment rates, um, homelessness, incarceration, victims of violence. And they are sometimes also seen in the lowest of thriving social justice indicators, including graduation rates, standardized testing, employment, and wealth. Here is, in this next um, slide, you're going to see um, some examples of what we call bookends, and they were derived from a data source that is being collected by the, our partners, the United Way for Greater Atlanta's Child Wellbeing Index. Um, this index covers the entire 11 county metro Atlanta area. So if you wanted to look up Child Wellbeing Index on your own time and just see what's happening in Atlanta or how the youth are doing in Atlanta, we definitely strongly encourage you to do that. For this example, we are focused in on the city of Atlanta. So this chart features five of the 16 indicators that are being tracked by the United Way. And on the left, you will see the indicator and on the right, you will see the data that is in the index disaggregated by race. 
So I cannot stress enough as you begin to deepen your understanding of your communities that make them more just and more equitable, that you do your research on the state of young people in your communities. The Child Wellbeing Index is based on an African proverb called Kassirian Injira, which is Swahili phrase that means, and how are the children? This is how they greet each other. This, um, this is a greeting among the Maasai tribe of Africa. And the greetings is, are used to acknowledge the importance that the Maasai play place on the well-being of their children. And the traditional response is Sapati Injira, which means the children are well. And the response can mean that life is good or that the properties of the, the priorities of protecting young people are in place and that peace and safety prevail. So even if your community does not have something like the child well-being index, there are several data sources that disaggregate um, data by race, and including the Annie Casey Children Kids Count and um, the US um, Census Bureau. If you are in Atlanta, our very own Maria, the Metro Atlanta Racial Equity Atlas may also be helpful to you. So looking at the data in this way will help you uncover the inequities that are impacting young people in your community and will help you to prioritize the youth that you want at your table. So um, as you can see on this chart, Black people are in the bookends in every indicator from median household income to families living in poverty to the number of the un uninsured. So we definitely want you to do your own research, take a look at some of the other um, data points and how that impacts your own community. We also want to acknowledge that we did not include data as it relates to indigenous people. We acknowledge that while um, populations are significantly smaller, Indigenous populations are significantly smaller than others listed here. We know that they can also show up in bookends as well. So now I want to turn it over to Jasmine, who will talk to us about youth-led movements. Thanks, Jessica. And so um, one thing that um, we kind of wanted to uh, level set on as we are going into the rest of this webinar is that there's often a very common misconception that young people either do not care about the issues that are face that they are facing in their community, or they don't do anything about it, or they're not knowledgeable enough to do anything. And if you look back in your history books and you look back, um, that's actually really not the case. Young people have consistently and always um, been at the head of the table, even if there are barriers in their way. Um, so one great example of this is back in the 60s during the civil rights movement, you have the Greensboro Sitter, um, where on February 1st of 1960, four black college students from North Carolina, North Carolina a and University sat at a white only's uh, lunch counter in Greensboro and they refused to leave and they were denied service. Um, and really this peaceful uh, protest drew national attention to the segregation that many black Americans were facing at the time and really started and uh, propelled a larger movement for that. Um, and it really just sparked a wider movement for civil rights. Um, another example that um, a lot of people are talking about, especially with the upcoming election, is making sure that we get young people out to vote. Um, and actually, um, there were it was the young people who fought for that right for themselves. So back in uh, March 1971, during um, the Vietnam War, there were larger calls to lower the voting age, um, specifically with millions of young men um, many under the age of 21 who are being drafted to fight for a war that many didn't even feel the need to fight in. And so the slogan really became old enough to fight, you're old enough to vote. And this is where we started to get a really common rallying cry of allowing young people um, over the age of 18 to contribute to um, who is in their elected positions in office. And then lastly, one that is really big, especially as it relates to land use and creating um, a just community um, is youth led movements around climate change. So one big one is the Sunrise Movement that Denise has actually also been a part of, which is um, one example of a youth led climate justice organization that advocates for the Green New Deal. Um, and the way they do this is they have over like 300 hubs 
nationwide where they aim to create climate change as a top political priority um, and also look to combating combating fossil fuel industry and the way that they finance um, uh, some of our elections and their general influence on our political system and also making sure that they're electing leaders committed to environmental and social well-being. So these are just three simple examples of how young people have been um, fighting for change in their communities. But it's also important to remember that there are many other examples and there are also many examples that are local to your community. Some that are not maybe um, as well known or that make the news headlines, but that young people are constantly looking for ways to influence their community in a positive way. Um, and I will go ahead and pass it over to Denise. Thank you, Devin, for going all of, um, over all of those like pivotal movements in our society. So we've kind of been talking about like youth-led movements, the importance of youth, all of that, but it's also really important that we level set about what youth power actually is. So youth power is when young people have the critical awareness, the skills, and the opportunities to positively impact their own lives and the lives of others in their community and organizations. So we often say that youth power building is both a process and outcome and a disruption. It's a process because it's usually like a series of steps or actions you have to take to unlock youth power and basically um, unlearn all like the adultist socialization that we've been taught when growing up but it's also an outcome so like me speaking at this webinar is a direct outcome of me building my youth power and obviously it's a disruption um, a disruption there are so many adults and even young people who can't really fathom seeing um, other youth in a space where they're just as equal and have just the um, same weight as adults in conversations And so after youth are able to be in these spaces by having youth power building, um, we start creating these youth and adult partnerships. So these partnerships are just conscious relationships that usually like establish and sustain intergenerational equity between youth and adults. So they exist when adults see youth as their full partners and solutions to issues, systems, and policies that directly affect young people. So to cultivate these youth adult partnerships, adults have to be aware of barriers that can really stunt these intergenerational solutions. And for youth, there is a lot of barriers to getting into the organizational field or just into an organization. So first off, compensation. Um, always put cash over compliments. So many young people who are working with adults tend to get pizza parties, compliments, thank you so much, and like verbal compensation. But what youth really need is to be paid for their contributions and for their work. You have to also pay them a good wage, and I'll dive into that later on. But other barriers consist of like adults not listening to young people once they actually get into these spaces, um, becoming a token youth, only being seen in pictures, shown in Zoom calls, and basically nothing but like an air freshener for adults to feel like they're being intergenerational. Um, even now, I still struggle with getting into new spaces and adults usually are shocked when they realize I actually want to contribute and I'm not just there to like listen in and just smile and wave. So um, it's really important to have youth not be tokenized and not be manipulated. Another thing, hierarchies. So many adults mess up these partnerships from the very first meeting they have with young people. Um, I've never called Jessica Miss Daniels. I've never called our founder, um, Nathaniel, Mr. Smith. I, I can't even imagine calling them that. And there was never an expectation for me to. Um, it's so important to have young people on the exact same level as you are and refrain from calling them kids or adding little to their titles. Um, I'm not a little youth staff. I manage projects and I meet deadline. So it's really important that you don't um, use those condescending words. Next, um, when you're working with youth who are usually like 14 to 24, it's really important to understand that those in high school are still in high school and those in college are still in college. There are so many milestones, deadlines, and finals that will change their capacity, change their communication, and so much more. So it's important to um, be conscious of all of that. And if you're getting youth that have deep lived experience and are staying in the issue areas you're working with, or if you want them to have credentials or certifications, you have to be ready to allocate funding in your budget for youth. So many people tend to forget that you have to fund for us. Um, that means giving them computers, um, transportation stipends and housing for relocation if you want them to be a part of like specific credentials or certifications. So making sure that you have those wraparound services, those are super important. 
And the very last barrier for young people, you guys can see it's like a little stop sign, but it's when they get to your organization and that's all, that's it, that's all. You don't really enrich them, you don't connect them, um, and you don't give them the resources to go to other community events, to go to other webinars, to um, kind of like expand their grasp. Um, if you don't, you might find yourself having issues with retentions because as they're growing and as they're aging up, they're realizing, oh, yeah, I've been doing this for a couple of years, but I think I have more of an interest on this side of things. And if you aren't giving them a space to grow within your organization, they will leave and find a space that will. And for adults, um, the barriers are mostly the same. Uh, well, not really the same, but more, more so on like biases and expectations. So, so many adults think that the best way to recruit young people and the best youth to recruit are those who are straight A students. So um, students who are on the principal's list and, and like have straight A's, are everywhere all at once. When you recruit those young people, you're sacrificing lived experience, flexibility, and so much more for youth. You feel like you won't have to train, you won't have to give them those critical awareness skills because they have all A's, they have all the opportunities. Um, and on the other side of adult barriers, it's the stigma that they tend to have with teens and youth. So they may think about their attitudes, their lack of responsibility, how everything is handed to them so they don't really care about anything. And you really have to sit and think with yourself, why do you feel um, this way about young people? Um, are you a parent? Have you had to raise your younger siblings? Do you have like a huge age gap between your younger siblings? Are you watching shows or TV shows or, or movies? Um, or you can even be reading articles or news articles that are basically talking about youth and showing them in one specific way. So it's really important to make sure and kind of like really check your biases. And um, a lot of adults also think that and also see us as babies or kids. Um, and they don't really want to add young people into that space because they're like, oh yeah, they're too young to think about these issues. They're too young to talk about the inequities. They're too young to talk about racism, all this. But so many of us are dealing with those issues every day. So many of us are paying bills with our parents, are using our money that we get from our part-time jobs and um, keeping ourselves afloat with that. So we should deserve to be in the space where we're talking about wages, where we're talking about housing and stability. It's so important. And lastly, um, time is also a barrier for adults too. We talked about in the um, youth barriers that yeah, um, we have our other um, like we have our other commitments with work and school and all of that. But adults also have time barriers. So youth tend to get out of school around three or five p.m. Um, and that's usually when our workday starts. And for most adults, that's when their workday ends. So they're out running errands, picking up their kids, and starting like to get ready to cook. So it's really important to accommodate youth in order to get the best solutions. I like. I am pretty sure a lot of people in our team would agree that our most interesting calls and workdays have been where our boss shows the human side of themselves, where they're hopping on and they're like, "Oh my gosh, uh, I." I gotta go pick up my kid. My wife wasn't able to do it, or uh, I'm actually cooking. I'm off camera right now, and that creates bonding. That creates conversations. And with that, I'll pass it off to Jasmine. Yeah. So, um, kind of just to do a quick wrap around of some of the barriers that um, Denise was talking about is they really kind of cultivate. Um, and combine, like mix together and create this larger system of adultism, which is really the ultimate barrier um, in terms of creating um, a strong and effective youth and adult partnership. So what exactly is adultism? I'm not sure why that slide is not um, accurately um, transitioning, but essentially what adultism is, is generally like the societal belief in the adult as the norm. Um, the ideal, the goal um, for young people, we often see that in our language as youth are the future, um, or youth are the future. They, um, you just need time to learn and grow. But in reality is young people have the abilities to contribute um, now in their, in their youthhood and with their current lived experiences and wisdom. So how does this show up? Um, first, it can show up in kind of personally attitude and um, your attitudes towards young people. So. This is more so like your personal feelings, assumptions, and beliefs that form a person's attitudes about young people. And so this can be some of the things that Denise, were Denise was talking about earlier in terms of those initial perceived biases towards young people. Next, um, once we've started to create this larger and social um, the feeling towards young people, um, it kind of creates this culture where um, it, um, 
promotes that um, the assumption that adults are superior to anyone who is who isn't identified as an adult simply because of their age. And it becomes sort of this larger cultural phenomenon as opposed to an individual bias that one might have against a young person. Um, and then lastly, it also shows up um, institutionally through discriminatory practices, policies, and equitable opportunities based on age within and between institutions. Um, one, two really great examples that I have is one when Denise was bringing up compensation earlier. Um, even if you are providing a livable wage for a young person, you have to ask yourself, is the work that they are doing and the work that they are contributing um, fair or proportional to what I am receiving in my salary um, as an adult staff, you know? Um, we have to question really if we are really valuing young people um, and we want them to have a seat at the table. If I'm an adult staff making a salary of, let's say $75,000 and I'm only giving my youth staff um, or my youth, the youth on my advisory board a $1,000 stipend for a three month period, is that really equitable? Another good example is that students now are unable to really vote or contribute in any sort of way as to who is on their school board or who's making decisions for their community. And so even with the voting age being 18, you still have young people, as Denise was saying, who are working, who are paying their taxes, and yet they are still prevented from contributing um, to who is in, elected, um, in their elected office in their communities. And so this is where we start to put up a mirror to ourselves as adult allies. Um, I really start to question, um, even if it's not within your organization, um, just in general, with any youth and um, adult partnership that you may have is ask yourself like whether you would treat an adult this way. Um, another big one is in terms of if you are ever giving some sort of praise or even um, constructive criticism, there's often a tone that adults can use with young people. Um, sometimes they can be over complimentary and be like, oh my gosh, you did so well. And almost assuming as if a young person couldn't do good work and kind of overcompensate for a really um, complimentary tone or in terms of when they're providing constructive criticism, be uh, more harsh than maybe and less professional than they would be with an adult. Um, and then there are uh, other good examples of ways that you can ask yourselves um, some reflective questions like would we have this expectation for an adult? Um, would we limit an adult's behavior in this way and really questioning whether or not um, you are enacting some sort of guardrails or barriers um, solely based off a person's age. And then that's where you have to start undoing those injustices. And so now we have to ask ourselves, what does it mean to undo a lot of this adultism? And that's where you can come in and be more of an adult ally. Um, so the way we define adult ally is a person who is a member of the dominant or majority age group who works to end the oppression of his or her personal and professional life through the support of and as an advocate for young people. Essentially meaning that as an ally, adults use their privilege and their power to support young people as agents for change. So the way that looks like is, for example, if I am working with an organization um, and there needs to be some administrative work that I might not be initially familiar with, um, an ally would come and, and support that. Or maybe there is a space that I would like to break into. Um, maybe I want to meet um, at my um, city hall to talk about climate change. Perhaps an ally would come in initially and set the framework to prevent any harm from being happening in that room in terms of the adults they're not taking me seriously. An ally would come in and say, hey, you really need to listen to this young person and really um, put, it, put down your perceived biases of this young person. Um, and here's some more adult ally guidance. Um, for the sake of time, we have uh, some other things in the PowerPoint that I would love to get to. So I'll just pick out some of my favorites. Um, the first one is being to listen attentively. Um, another one of my favorites here, which may seem counterintuitive as someone who's talking about building youth power, is um, the last one on the left here saying, um, do not entrust youth with decision making and leadership positions without, which is the key word, training, practice, and understanding their responsibilities. Um, I think there's also a space or and also an instance where adults may feel like, oh, young people want to be treated as adults. Okay, go ahead, make all these decisions, step into the leadership. Um, and that's not necessarily the case. One thing about being an adult ally is that you recognize that there are systemic barriers that pre have prevented young people from really um, stepping into their power and learning how to make decisions or having leadership practices 
And so when you initially put a young person in that position, um, it results in failure. You wouldn't do that for an adult who's at an entry level position. So it's the same thing with young people and making sure that you're providing them with the adequate training and practice and an understanding of their responsibilities. Um, another one is the this orange one on the right, which is um, making sure that um, you give young people accurate information about the way the world works, our experience relationships, and the contributions of young people um, to humankind and other inter other <coughs> other interests um, that issues that interest them. Um, I think oftentimes adults feel the need to sugarcoat things for young people um, and making sure that they kind of shield them and protect them. Again, coming in with that par parental mentality, but that really inhibits and prevents young people from being able to fully um, contribute to whatever issue that they um, are most interested in or looking to solve. Um, for example, if you're talking about climate change and you're talking about the influence of the fossil fuel industry, you wouldn't lie to a young person and say, just say like, oh, like go ahead and fight for it. Like you would um, talk about the realities of what it means um, to work in the climate change space and really make sure that you're giving a young person the full picture. And so now you might be asking, okay, this all sounds great, but like, why should I do it? And so we kind of have separated out in between what youth gain, adults gain, and what communities gain. So first off, youth um, develop a lot of the critical skills to lead, advocate, and take action um, and understanding the root causes of issues affecting their world. Um, another one of my favorite bullet points on here is that youth are able to strengthen their civic consciousness, empathy, and passion for improving the lives and transforming society. Um, they also discover their intrinsic value and the vital role that they play in shaping their future. Um, and also young people are able to challenge adult-centric norms and start to really earn their respect and recognition as equal partners in decision-making processes. So you're really starting to build up young people at, a, at an early age. And by doing this, um, and you're doing this by being able to give them a seat at the table as opposed to prepping them for a quote-unquote seat at the table. Um, and you might be asking yourself, as an adult, what do I gain? And so um, there's lots to gain from it. I'm sure Jessica Daniels could give a whole separate webinar as to what adults gain from um, participating in youth adult partnerships. Um, but some of the key ones that you gain is being able to have authentic insights into youth experiences and directly informing um, their understanding of young people's needs and concerns. So really just being able to understand what young people need. Young people are also stakeholders in whatever issues that you're trying to solve. Um, another one is that um, young people come in with new perspectives and innovative ideas and enthusiasm that really allow for a more energized collaboration and an energized feeling to the work. Um, another one is that adults are able to now um, create shared decision-making power with young leaders, um, to, uh, which leads to more effective and inclusive problem-solving approaches. Um, you're also, by embracing youth power, adults develop skills and awareness, um, which are crucial for equitable systems change at the organizational and community levels. Um, and so really what all of this means is that at the end, you are putting equity into practice. Um, oftentimes, I think, especially for um, like people like myself, like other um, individuals who are in, um, who are, come from marginalized communities, but are put in positions of power or positions of influence to help influence their community. Um, sometimes there are blinders on in terms of sort of the biases that you um, can enact on other groups of people, and that includes young people. And so when you start to include young people um, in, at the conversation, this is where you're really just starting to put the full word and the full breadth of equity into practice. Um, equity doesn't just extend to race, gender, socioeconomic status, sexuality, ability, um, all of those things. It also includes age um, because we have to recognize that young people are also living in the communities that we live in. So they should also have a fair say in terms of what happens in their community. And lastly, what do communities gain? Um, I think that they ultimately benefit from the youth voice and youth advocacy um, to advance um, equitable systems and policies change. Um, there's a stronger um, youth and adult partnerships in your community that can um, compound and translate into even more stronger community change. Um, you also ultimately get a fresh perspective on policy making, um, which creates a more racially equitable um, change and that's 
fully representative of the entire community. And lastly, I think you ultimately do still get at that um, phrase that you for the future, um, and that you really are creating this general pipeline of citizens who are more knowledgeable and invested in civic engagement and um, and leadership for positive community change. And so if you have a group of young people who have been doing policy and systems change work since they were 16, they have been advocating for more equitable societies. Can you imagine what they would be then once they're 30 and they are also creating, um, they're also doing their own youth and adult-led partnerships? Um, it really just creates um, a stronger community. Um, and I will go ahead and pass it to Denise who will cover our youth power model. Yes. So thank you so much, Jasmine. So you guys have been hearing us just talk about like the importance of critical awareness, skill development and opportunities. That's with our youth power model. Um, and it's really important to know that you cannot have youth power without having all three. So I could have all the critical awareness and skill development in the world, but I don't have any opportunities to kind of um, uplift my voice and have it on that stage. Um, and you guys can just like kind of swap it and figure it out. But you guys will know that like you have to have all three. But um, as easy as it is to say it, I thought that would be great idea to kind of show it as well. Okay, so what do you guys see in these pictures? Um, some of you guys may say, oh my gosh, she has a flip phone in that picture, or she's holding a cat, or my, or oh my gosh, her bangs look so cute, or yeah, there's a lot of things. But in these pictures, I see and I remember a journey. So um, in all of these pictures, I went to, this is kind of my journey through elementary school. I went to four different elementary schools, two different middle schools, and luckily one high school. So that meant for elementary school and middle school, I changed schools every other year. And I didn't know why we moved around that much. This is all around Metro Atlanta. I didn't really understand why we moved so much. But um, once I got to my ninth and 10th grade year, I was able to actually understand. So once I got to high school, I was able to join a youth council called the Brighter Future Youth Leadership Council with United Way of Atlanta. And this was actually created and ran by youth. Um, this is like created by one of our co-workers, Virgil McBride. She also works in partnership with Southern Equity now. And the reason I joined was because my friend and co-worker, Rachel, um, she knew that I moved so much and she thought that I would be um, able to shed a bit of light into that issue that I faced. And um, I stayed because I was getting paid. It was something so new to me, and I thought it was so weird that all I had to do was go to these meetings, talk about my life, research some statistics, learn a bit, and then get paid for it. And because of this financial freedom I had with this council, I was able to use that money for me and my sister. We were able to buy snacks, groceries, and school supplies or whatever else we wanted that our mom wasn't able to afford. And while being at this council, I learned that what I was going through was called student mobility issues. And I was able to advocate for youth to parents and other adults to keep students in their community and focus on housing stability. So while advocating, I was able to get trainings, gain important research skills. Um, Rachel and I actually created a 60 page toolkit for our um, peers about their um, post-secondary options we were able to talk to the superintendent and um, talk to our principal in a way that wasn't student and principal, but was more concerned community members talking to decision makers. And that was something that I had never experienced before. And there's so many more examples, but these skills and the critical awareness I was able to get um, gave me a really strong foundation. And although I only joined because of the compensation, I was really able to understand and to really fall in love with fixing the issues that I had struggled with throughout my childhood and throughout my adolescence and actually find solutions for it. And I also remember that I had to choose between working at Burger King or relying on my community organizing as my only source of income. And when I chose community organizing and I quit my, my part-time job at Burger King, I remember my mom was livid because I didn't understand that what I was doing paid me more. Like didn't, It like paid me and it gave me so much more experience than Burger King could have ever had. And I was so happy that I was able to choose between those two. And um, last thing, when I was... Um, in 12th grade, I ended up becoming homeless and I was in a hotel and all of the issues I worked on, I would come back and 
I would come back home and live with it. And I was given support from the Partnership for Southern Equity with college advice, with funding for dorm essentials, a computer to do my work, um, a travel stipend whenever we had to go around, and a platform to talk about my lived experience. So I can't imagine where I would be if I didn't choose community organizing to help me and what um, like, and what would happen if I would have just stayed at Burger King. And another question that I tend to ask myself is, okay, what if I did join that youth council and I was tokenized and I wasn't listened to and I was constantly put down as being a kid, even though I had so many other issues going on in my life. I, I know that I would have left and I would have looked away from being an advocate altogether. And especially since I didn't even know what community organizing was or what being an advocate looked like. And all of these experiences that I got were able to turn into opportunities. I was able to write my first book about intergenerational collaboration. Um, I was able to be a part of documentaries around Metro Atlanta. I opened up international conferences about health equity. I work with mayors. I'm the key informant on so many projects around Georgia and I do social and um, scientific research. Um, and this is all possible because I have the critical awareness and the skill development to actually like keep me afloat. And so when we were going over our slides yesterday, Jasmine said that so many young people get the critical awareness and get skills from other walks of life. And so we really need to focus on getting opportunities for young people so they can really step into their power. And so for the past two years, I've been working with Mayor Andre Dickens in Atlanta, and I'm helping the civic engagement and issues in Atlanta from a youth perspective. And if you can look closely at this picture, I'm not smiling. In so many spaces, I'm considered the first, the first young person here, the first person without a college degree, the first student, and I'm really sick of being the first. I'm almost 21, and that means I'm aging out in like three years, and I, and we need to have people who are younger than me. Um, we often hear adults say that we are the future, but why are we the future when everyone is suffering now? So many young people are suffering now, and we deserve to be in these spaces talking about our experiences. But in order for us to be in these spaces, we have to be ready for you. Adults have to be ready for us. And that's where the hard ladder of youth participation comes in. And it's a ladder for a reason. Um, a few slides ago, we talked about time and accommodation for youth. We, really, we usually want people to stay at the top three and avoid the bottom three. And I urge all of you guys to think about where you are on the ladder and think about where your organization is on the ladder. So school just started for me. This is like a third day of school right now. And I really want my adult allies to be on the adult initiated with shared decisions with youth right now because I'm like going through my syllabus and I'm like, oh my gosh. But once I get out, like once, I guess like next week or two weeks from now and I'm acclimated, I would love for us to go right back up to youth initiated with shared decisions with adults or youth initiated and directed because I'm ready. And then we would kind of shift right back down to adult initiated once I have finals because my capacity is changing. So it's really important for adults to be okay with going up and down the slide because it is unrealistic for us to always be youth initiated with shared decisions with adults if young people have um, a school life. So what do adult allies need to know? You have to ask your question. You have to ask these questions to yourself. Who is at the table? Do you take the time to know the youth at the table? When, where, and how is that table created? What happens when the youth want to stand on it? And how can we cultivate effective youth adult partnerships? And once you understand those questions, you'll be able to get into the how of everything. And we can have the next one as well. Okay, everyone. So I recognize that a lot of you are even in the chat or even as your questions are asking, okay, okay, I get it, I get it. How do I even do this? And so we would love to talk with you more. Um, and what we are planning to do, if you have questions, we would ask that you would please take a few seconds right now to add them to the chat, I mean, to your Q&A section. Um, and then also we would be happy to stay a little bit longer if your time permits to, um, if you want to um, engage in a Q&A session. Um, I also wanted to let you know that um, if you go to the next slide, We do have a few training and training 
and resources for you. Um, so we do have our adult ally training that will help you to actually build out a youth leader team or engage an existing one in your community. We also have a way of, if you already are serving young people already in your organization, we can give you an assessment that will measure where you are in your racial equity and youth power building journey um, and how to improve. And then also we provide technical assistance. Our youth team is um, actually also can train youth leaders that you already are in relationship with or the ones that you form. Um, and they will be able to help them with how to actually do advocacy train advocacy and organizing in their community. We also have a youth skills and awareness and um, interest inventory that also measures who they are as individuals and how they are impacting their community as well. So thank you all so much um, for your time and your um, energy and your abilities to um, affect your communities in the ways that you're going to do. We are so thrilled to be your partner in building youth power in the American South and beyond. Uh, thank you so much, so much. You all have uh, have brought lots of things to mind that uh, I know we'll all be digesting and, <laughs> and how do we bring that more into our work? And I just want to um, make sure to, to express that gratitude for you and, um, and please just encourage everyone on the line, think about how you can engage with youth in your work. Um, think about if you're just looking at the beginnings of applying the protocol and maybe you're in the groundwork phase of, of that process, think about your working group um, and who is going to guide and steer your efforts um, through the entire Just Communities process and, and what youth voices are not at that table, who you could be bringing in. Um, so reach out to us, to our team. We'll make sure to connect you. Um, and we are absolutely considering um, finding a date to offer up a, a deeper adult ally training. Um, so consider that this is something, you know, if you're looking for ways to get some continuing education credits um, for the Just Communities AP program, this is a great um, option for you. Um, and finally, Denise, tell everyone the name of your book. Yes, it's called Why Aren't We Doing This? Um, collaborating with Minors in Major Ways. Excellent. Well, thank you. Hopefully uh, y'all will go look for that. Um, check it out and uh, learn and share it. Um, I want to leave everybody today with just a reminder about our next webinar that'll be coming up September the 25th, uh, same time slot, um, lunchtime, um, Eastern Coast time at least. Um, and the focus is gonna be on democratizing development and community organizing models to advance equity. Um, so we hope that you will join us then to learn uh, more, more things to add to your toolkit and how to uh, integrate equity into your work. Um, thank you so much for your time and attention. Um, stay tuned for other emails from the Just Communities team about our next AP training, our um, asynchronous self-directed course that's going to be going online very soon. Um, and we will look forward to connecting with you further. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day.